Hi there, I'm James McGregor, publisher of the Silicon Valley San Jose Business Journal. And on behalf of Rosenden Electric, XL Construction, and Encito Consulting, I'd like to welcome you to our third annual Healthcare CEO Summit. Healthcare reform, a new administration in Sacramento, and planned hospital construction were just some of the topics that we covered at this year's event. Our panelists were Amir Dan Rubin, President and CEO of Stanford Hospital and Clinics, Mike Johnson, CEO at Regional Medical Center in San Jose, Chris Dawes, President and CEO of Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, and Terry Austin, Senior Vice President and Area Manager for Kaiser Permanente San Jose. What you're watching is the video from the event that took place on March 4th at the Santa Clara Convention Center. I hope you find the information helpful, and I'd like to hear from you. Please call me at 408-299-1801 and let me know what you thought of this year's event. Thanks, and enjoy. Um, so this question is uh, for all of you. Um, you know, it's been about a year uh, since the president signed the health care reform bill. Um, a lot has happened since then. Um, how, how has the uncertainty around the health care reform bill impacted your hospital? And Amir, I'll, I'll start with you on that. Well, it's a great question. I think I'll probably go to... Uh, the comment that Chris made, I, I think the bigger driver is the economy. So uh, in a leading level, the impact of health reform um, is really going to be impacted by the economy. And what happens with the federal and the state budget drive Medicare and Medicaid, which are uh, Medicare is a program for seniors over 65, uh, federally driven program, and Medicaid is a state and federal uh, collaboration for uh, lower income patients. Mm -hmm. So those are obviously very driven by uh, the economy and federal and state resources. Uh, and then on the commercial side, um, you all, <laughs> the ability to uh, buy health insurance and to offer benefits to employees is based on your economic well-being. So I think the, uh, the broader economic factors are driving both health reform and, um, and the commercial market. Mike? Yeah, I would agree with uh, some of Amir's comments. It, it's, um, I would categorize it this way. Up to this point, I don't know that there's been a significant impact on our day-to-day -day operations. What it ha that Now, the economy has. The, we the weakness in the economy, I think, affects all businesses, including health care providers and, and hospitals. Um, uh, I, I think what's happened in terms of positioning for health care reform is hospitals beginning to think about and planning for the structure that we will be able to adapt to to be successful under different components of health care reform. And it's pretty complex in terms of how this will roll out. And, and what do you mean by structure? Well, structure from the perspective of looking at our expense structure, looking at our strategy for physician alignment, looking at accountable health care organizations, gain sharing opportunities, co-management agreements with physicians. Those kinds of things could come out of um, uh, you know, some of the um, incentives sure. that are uh, outlined in health care reform. So it's a pretty complex ecosystem. I think we're trying to model what that will look like and prepare for it and adapt for it. But in terms of today, a significant, it has not had a lot of significant impact on our day-to-day -day operations. I think in, over time, it absolutely will. I agree with Mir. The more immediate issue really has been the weakness in, in softening the economy. And, and clearly, health care reform plays into that over time. Sure. Chris? Um, well, you know, I think that, that certainly on a day-to-day -day basis, the health care reform itself, as has already been stated, has not had a dramatic impact on the delivery system today. I think it's all about what we anticipate, as I mentioned earlier, is going to happen. Um, however, before I mention, go into a little bit more of that, I do want to say that there, I know that many of us um, – feel that there's, uh, this has health re reform, it should be repealed, and there's all this bad stuff and so forth. But in reality, there is a lot of good things about this particular bill, while there are some things that clearly are not good and, and need to be either eliminated or modified. But you know, as a children's hospital, let me just speak to two things that, that, are, that are in place today and um, are very positive about this bill. First of all, we, as a children's hospital, we take care of chronically ill children. And as part of the bill uh, last fall went into effect, the removal of annual and lifetime caps. 
So you can imagine, and some of you may even be in this position, if you have a chronically ill child, uh, you can very re easily reach that lifetime cap. And once you reach that lifetime cap, then it starts eating into your savings, then it starts impacting your, your quality of life, and then eventually um, uh, you may move, you may have to uh, move on to Medicaid or something like that. So, um, you know, that piece of the legislation has had an enormous impact on a small number of people, but these are the people who are most in desperate need of this care. So that's one thing that occurred last fall that I think is very, very positive. The other thing that has occurred last fall, which obviously also impacts children's hospitals, uh, is the fact that now, um, and I'm sure, I know I'm impacted by this, and I'm sure many of you are, is that now you can keep your, your young adult children um, on your health plan. And particularly with the economy as it is today, so you get that child goes through college, gets out of college, and wham, they have to go out and get health insurance. But now you can keep them on um, your plan until they're 26. So those are two very important, I think, very positive things have, that have occurred. Having said all that, I think that what, um, as, as Terry suggested that, I'm sorry, uh, Mike suggested that um, the threat of, well, certainly the economy and the threat of health reform, I think has really had an, an impact on how health providers are looking at how they provide care. Um, and certainly every executive I talk to is talking about lean in terms of how to reduce waste, how do we um, provide, you know, improve productivity, how do we maintain safety and, and quality and so forth, and try and add, you know, the infamous word, how do we add value, more value um, to, to the delivery of care. So I think that it's really stimulated, and I think in this valley in particular, we have a great deal of opportunity to really look at some innovative ways to try and uh, wrestle uh, the, the uh, cost of health care. It won't be short term. It'll take several years, but I do think we're off to a, a, a potentially positive start if we can keep working together uh, to really look at these issues. And Terry, I want to hear from you on, sure. this, on this question. Um, <clears throat> I absolutely agree with my three colleagues. Um, uh, uh, in Kaiser, what we know first and foremost is we will grow membership. In, in uh, January, um, we just didn't have an idea how much membership we might grow. In January, in, um, in Santa Clara County, we uh, grew by 9,500 members. And about 35% of that membership was the result of the provision <clears throat> that Chris was describing about dependents being able to be enrolled on their parents' uh, plan up to age 26. Uh, that's an extraordinary improvement in the access to health care. And what healthcare is really about is access to healthcare. So there's a, a tremendous amount of um, uh, a benefit, I think, in, in, the, in, those, in the legislation if we all make it work uh, that uh, will benefit the, the, um, the residents of Santa Clara County and, and certainly the entire state and country. I think that um, the other piece for Kaiser Permanente is the other key to the success is, as Chris said, doing it well. Um, we do have to be cost effective. We do have to be efficient. Um, we do have to um, look for best practices throughout the industry and adopt them, and adopt them quickly. We, we have a, a term in Kaiser Permanente called lift and drop, uh, where in, in the past, uh, sometimes there's been struggle with one medical center observing what another medical center is doing well and just simply adopting the practice. And so we're, we're encouraging, uh, and in fact, in we some cases... We call that stealing in the media Stealing, business. okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we call it lifting and dropping because sometimes it's just that simple and, and uh, allows for all of our medical centers to be equivalently effective in delivering care. So with, with all of the uncertainty about what's ahead, how does that impact your hospital's ability to deliver patient care? Or does it? And I'll... I'll I'll throw that out to all of you. Come here. Well, uh, you know, one of the things that sometimes annoys me about our industry, maybe about any industry, is everybody thinks there's one strategy and there's one way to succeed. And so health reform now, everybody's going to do the same thing and everybody's going to have the same strategy. And I, I just don't think that's, that's the way to succeed. Um, you know, and particularly if you look at this region and this community and what's come out of Silicon Valley, uh, we're going to do things differently. Um, I think I agree wellness and prevention is important, but we have a lot of sick people. We have an aging population. We're going to have a tremendous increase in those 65 and over. 
and they're going to be sick. There's no prevention that's going to affect, affect the uh, epidemic we have of obesity. Over 25% of the United States is obese, um, and that is increasing significantly. We have uh, huge issues with congestive heart failure and COPD and diabetes. And uh, the prevention time frame is 10, 20, 30 years on something like diabetes. So we have to think of new ways how do we care for this growing population and potentially a population that now is insured that, that didn't have insurance. And I tell you, if we bring 40... It's even an access problem well, at, I, at some I, point. I think we're going to have an access problem and we're going to also have at some level a cost problem. If you bring 45 million new uninsured into the marketplace who hasn't had insurance, um, where is that going to come from? So I think what we need to start doing is thinking about different ways of delivering care. Uh, uh, what do we do at the home? What do we do remotely? What do we do via telepresence? Uh, how do we interact with electronic medical records? Stanford, along with some of these other fine institutions on the stage here, are leaders in, in interacting with patients in new ways. Uh, we're partnering, as some of you might have heard, uh, in the Business Journal with uh, some of the leading Silicon Valley companies to define what the future of healthcare looks like. So I, I think there is not going to be one strategy uh, because I think just uh, everybody doing the same thing isn't necessarily going to deliver the absolute best and in innovative care. People are going to have cancer. People are going to have mm -hmm. heart disease. And people are going to want improved quality of life. It's how do we do that? How do we uh, do it in, in, in less uh, invasive ways? And, and another thing that we're working on at Stanford is how do we do it two years earlier than we're doing it today? So, you know, we're ranked by U.S. News and World Report as one of the top academic medical centers in the world. And we have huge transplant programs. Well, how do we get that patient two years earlier? So they're already sick. They already went to four right. specialists. They've been to the emergency department. And, and we're not going to prevent that. But how do we maybe prevent the sure. transplant? And those are some of the things that, that we're thinking about. Mike, Chris, or Terry, do you have anything to add on the uncertainty well, there? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the uncertainty, um, in some ways, uncertainty, as Amir is suggesting, is driving innovation. Um, since we don't know what's coming around the corner, we're trying to figure out what uh, we can do to best, you know, uh, uh, pull our resources together to be prepared for whatever we think might come around the corner. Uh, we've just, uh, we're just wrapping up our a 10-year long-range financial plan. And when you think about it, it's almost impossible to do. Um, uh, you know, if we can predict 24 months in advance, that that's a good that's a good thing. Uh, and even that's hard to do. But I think as we began to look at what might happen down down the road. Um, it triggers um, behavior changes in our organization. Um, and, I, and I do strongly believe, um, as I think all of us have been suggesting, this is a valley that has tremendous capabilities. Um, you know, the, uh, I was uh, just looking at the announcement uh, a couple of days ago of um, you know, Steve Jobs with the, with the new iPad um, that is coming out. And when you start thinking about what, how could you utilize that technology to better manage a patient with diabetes, mm -hmm. to better manage, um, uh, uh, to help a family um, eat better, so you can begin to address obesity. Sure. Um, so there's, you know, there's there's enormous opportunity here, and I think if we can tap into some of that innovation and direct it towards um, uh, healthcare, um, uh, innovative ways of managing patients or preventing health, uh, preventing uh, illness or better, you know, getting two years ahead of it, as Amir suggested. Um, I think those are the kinds of things we can do. And creating these partnerships, I think, is going to be very important to, to, to do that. Yes, Mike. The, the only thing I would add, and, and like and many of you in your business, uh, the, the trick will be how are, how, how are we to be successful in a bifurcated system where we have to provide care under the current paradigm while concurrently transitioning into kind of a new way of thinking in healthcare. Um, as Amir indicated, though, there, the, the commonality is this, that the patient doesn't go away. If you look at the demographics, you look at the aging of the population, you look at the propensity for diabetes and obesity and for uh, cancer, for cardiac care, for trauma, for stroke, and you really d drill down to that from an epidemiological epidemiology perspective, what you're going to find is there's actually going to be more health care delivered in this country over the next 30 years. That What we have to do is provide that in a smarter way and a more cost-effective way. So there's a lot of investment. What, what I think this does, James, I think this alters how we invest in our infrastructure. And it was, as was alluded to earlier, 
all of us are spending a huge um, uh, capital investment in, in investing in information systems that gives us data that allows us to make better decision and to map the provision of care. Evidence-based order sets, standardized approaches to healthcare, reducing variation to improve quality uh, and, uh, uh, and better outcomes. At Regional Medical Center, that is our absolute number one focus is quality. As I indicated in my introductory remarks, the whole notion of clinical excellence is absolutely essential, not only to our hospital, Good Samaritan, but obviously to our colleagues here. And so as an industry, uh, that, that's where we're going. That's where we have to go. That's where the mandate is. That's what you expect as a consumer. That's what the government wants. And Terry, any further thoughts there? Yeah. <clears throat> the, the impact of, I would suggest that the impact of health care reform um, has not yet been felt. Um, but it will. And that's why all of us are fervently planning for that, for that time at Kaiser. It's, it's really about facility capacity. Uh, because we, once an a, a individual becomes a Kaiser member, Kaiser has the obligation to provide the facilities and the expertise and the human resources necessary to provide them care. So we have to make sure that for now, as well as in the future, we've got the facilities to provide that care, we've got the human resources to provide that care. We're leveraging the clinical technology, which I, I would suggest we could all do a better job of and perhaps make that more of an integrated model so that we're, so that we're connecting uh, not just with, with uh, individuals within an organization but outside of an organization and finding ways to do that more effectively. And also managing chronic conditions. Chronic conditions are the, 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 uh, the single most critical part of our cost structure at this point from the standpoint of uh, the uh, cost of healthcare increasing. So we have to have a better way of dealing with that. All of you have talked about the economy. Um, I'd be interested to hear from each of you how your payer and patient mix has changed over the last 18 months. Because I, I know that the, the, the payment mix changes as people you know, are, uh, shift from employment to unemployment and are they insured and are they uninsured. And Amir, I'll start with you. How, how has your payer mix changed in the last 12 to 18 months? Well, uh, great question, James. And, and really the payer mix or the, uh, the definition of that is the kind of groupings of patients, whether they're from commercial plans or Medicare or from Medicaid or from uninsured, is an important driver of our economic well-being. I would say overall, in, uh, for us in this region, it hasn't changed that much over the last few years. I think we're a little bit in a surreal world here in the Silicon Valley because of the incredible companies that you all represent here. Um, speaking with some of my colleagues around the country, I have some friends who are in hospital administration in Michigan. Uh, very different story. Very different, uh, very different story in, in some places, uh, even in our, in our own state. Uh, I'm coming from Southern California. My institution down there was fine, but there was others that literally had huge changes in payer mixes. So I think what you're also seeing is a little bit of some haves and some have-nots. And I think when Mike's talking about structure and connections, you know, we may see more of those kind of things happening in the marketplace because it's, it's uh, difficult and complicated to survive. Uh, I was talking with a friend who's in another industry. And he said, so let me get this straight. You have la high labor costs, right? Yes. You have high capital costs. Yes. You have uh, h high union penetration. Yes. You're highly government regulated. Yes. And you're highly competitive. Yes. He said, why are you in this field? <laughs> and we're in this field because of the mission and, and, and healing uh, humanity. Um, but so, so far we've done okay here on the payer mix. But, you know, these, our institutions have very small margins. And so they're very sensitive to slight changes. So sure. using Chris's rapid analogy, you know, a small blip. Uh, we're a $2 billion organization with a razor thin margin. You know, a point or two on that takes you in, in, a, in a lot of different directions. Mike? Yeah, Amir had mentioned several of those factors, and it ties to my earlier comment about complexity. And, and we also have very small margins, uh, and yet so we have to manage that effectively like all of you do uh, in, in, in your business. Um, and uh, the specifics of the question again, James? The specifics of the question are how, how has the payer mix yeah. 
for you changed in the last 12 to 18 months? Yeah, same, similar thing. We've had some deterioration in our payer mix, but not significant. It is interesting. It's probably better in Northern California. As you indicated, Michigan is struggling. Many areas of the country are struggling. Uh, at one time, it was in Texas, South Texas, very different uh, situation from a payer mix. Now, what's interesting within um, healthcare, uh, and I'm thinking about regional medical center in particular, uh, and, and this is what this will be interesting as we evolve as a healthcare delivery system. But we have different structures even with hospitals. So, for example, in our case, being investor-owned both at Regional Medical Center and Good Samaritan Hospital, uh, we pay taxes. Uh, you know, other providers are not for profit, and so they don't pay taxes, uh, and or they have an academic mission, uh, what have you. So it. And, and where I'm going with that is, is that healthcare in this country is financed differently, and we have different safety net providers. And so that all adds to not only the complexity of the delivery system, but it also impacts uh, what, how healthcare is, um, uh, is going to be structured on a go-forward basis. But related to our particular situation, uh, as Amir said, it's, it's, it's similar. I mean, it, it's changed a little bit, but not significantly. And Terry, Chris? To yeah, I, I, in our case, uh, we have not seen a dramatic shift in the payer mix, meaning in our case, commercial versus Medicaid. We're obviously, we're not a Medicare hospital, um, and we have not seen a, a dramatic shift. We've seen a gradual shift of uh, from commercial to Medicaid over the last several years. Um, you know, about 2005, we were about 35 percent Medicaid. Um, now we're about 41 percent Medicaid. Um, so it has been shifting slowly over the over the years, but a couple of comments related to that. I mean, I think that opens the question, James, in terms of so what is what does the payer mix really mean? Um, to put that in very real economic terms, um, uh, what that means at Luso Packard Children's Hospital is that um, f uh, the forty one percent of the patients that we take care of who are paid for by the government by the state of California through the Medicaid program. Um, generate um, uh, the delta between what it costs us to provide care to those patients versus, again, what we cost, not what we charge, what we cost us to pay care, to take care of those patients versus what we get paid by the state of California. Uh, last year was $150 million. So this raises the whole spectrum of a term that's used in the industry, and I think many of you are beginning to hear about it in the Wall Street Journal and so forth, and that's this infamous term, cost shifting. Because we have to produce a bottom line, we have to build a new billion dollar building, we have to buy new equipment, and so on and so forth, we have to pay our staff, uh, and so forth, so we have to generate a profit to pay for all those things. Um, and uh, so we therefore have to, and I'll go on the record, I've said it in many other groups, we have to therefore charge the commercial payers more so that we can cover that $150 million. Um, now, there's lots of articles out there now saying, well, we've got to eliminate cost shifting. Fine, I'm happy to eliminate cost shifting, but what am I going to do with that $150 million? Um, I was uh, just last week down in Los Angeles meeting with the executives from Anthem Blue Cross, and we talked about this very issue. Um, and, uh, of course, they would like it, and you as employers, we as an employer, I could lower our commercial rates fairly significantly if I didn't have to pay that $150 million. But I'm certainly not holding my breath that somehow the feds or the states are suddenly going to find money to increase the payment for Medicaid. So that's a problem that is not going to go away. And I think that's a very, very significant issue for the health care delivery system because that's $150 million. We're an $800 million enterprise. That's one hospital. Um, one you know, modestly sized children's hospital in this country. Um, and that's a big issue. And, it's, and it is a different from state to state. It is more dramatic in the state of California, um, which I won't go into why, um, than it is in other states. Um, but it is an issue that we have to deal with. And so when we talk about payer mix, that is um, uh, uh, one of the most significant aspects of it. And at Kaiser, we don't talk about payer mix as, as the fee-for-service world does. Um, we, we actually talk about it as a program. So um, over 95% of the, of the people who, who get care at Kaiser Permanente from a revenue perspective are Kaiser members. Uh, however, um, they may belong to uh, the Medicare program and, and be a part of our Medicare Advantage program. They may become 
uh, a Kaiser member through our CHIPS program sure. or our Medi-Cal managed care program. So we, we have the same impact, actually, as, as fee-for-service hospitals from the standpoint that <clears throat> the federal government is indexing the cost of those uh, the, the, of caring for those patients in a managed care environment to the fee-for-service world. So our uh, income is, uh, for, for that portion of our membership, is also declining, and that uh, obviously concerns us a great deal. So we know we're going to have more of those people, though, because uh, about half of the uh, eligibles who will become eligible uh, with, uh, with um, health care reform will, co will come through uh, Medicaid exchanges, so we know that that's a, a different population, at least at Kaiser, than we have ever um, served before. And we're spending a great deal of time learning how and coming up with ways to serve that population most effectively. So this next question is for Amir and Mike. Uh, each of you have spent a large amount of your career elsewhere. And Amir, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, you spent a lot of time in Southern California. How is the business of what you do different between Southern California and Northern California? Well, I was in a medical staff me meeting last week and I made a Kardashian comment. <laughs> and c coming from Los Angeles, that would have played great. And like, <laughs> right, right, right. nobody <laughs> flinched. Yeah, you know, so I quickly had to refer to John Muir yeah. or you know, something, <laughs> you know, naturalist. And um, so, you know, there is a real. I think what's so fantastic about this community is this incredible community. I mean, this really is a place like no other. So the overlay of, you know, even the old businesses here are new, and the new businesses are like started yesterday. And then, uh, you know, we have such a mix from uh, the university culture to the startup culture to the venture capital to small business to a lot of service industries. And I think that's really unique and special and different. And I think it does open up uh, potentially different approaches uh, for healthcare and, and healthcare delivery. Is it harder to get things done in Northern California than in Southern California? Well, um, like a construction project? They're, they're both still in California. <laughs> and probably like many of you all who are trying to navigate our state. Versus um, Texas. It, 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 versus Texas. Both yeah. of us were in Texas. Right, right. It's a very different business climate. I, I'll tell you what, you want to talk about cost of health care. Um, and and um, uh, we, we have to shell out $200 million to get the entitlement to build in our city. Well, we're, we're, we're a university affiliated nonprofit healthcare with rate. Where do we get $200 million? Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, that's it. it. It doesn't come from anywhere else. Um, now, uh, having come from the uh, UCLA system and dealing with Westwood and Santa Monica and those kind of neighborhoods, and those of you in the construction field, yeah, it's not much easier down, down there. But you know, we don't like the long lead times, and we're big into lean, and we want to shorten the processes. Uh, but when you have uh, reviews sometimes, uh, and, and the state uh, does some great reviews and has some great processes, but they're also not that well funded to do these right. construction reviews, so you might be waiting four months. Um, so it, it's a difficult, difficult environment, and having worked in New York, which has some similarities <laughs> to California, we're not set up to be low cost. You know, there's, there's, there's not a lot of factors that are pushing low cost. There's a lot of factors that are pushing uh, longer lead times as opposed to shorter lead times and, and longer construction schedules. Um, and, and I think that's where maybe technology has the opportunity to break through that um, because we don't have to get approvals to put in electronic medical records. Uh, so I, I'm hopeful, but that's, that is a difficulty in doing business in the state. Mike? Yeah, there, there, there's no, there's no doubt. There's some difference. I, you know, I've, I've been fortunate. I've been able to work in several places. So I spent a lot of my career in Texas, but I was also in uh, Nebraska at Creighton University Medical Center, which was also uh, academic, and then Las Vegas, and now here in California. Uh, and no, not only operationally, but related to the regulations. Uh, you know, working in a different states and a different environments really does give you a, a, di a different perspective. So uh, I've worked in public hospitals, academic not-for-profit Catholic, investor-owned, and rules. So I'm now absolutely schizophrenic, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, looking at all those. Uh, there, there are a lot of great things in California, and it's, it's a wonderful state. Uh, it's clearly, in my mind, um, a, a little uh, 
uh, it, it is different than other states. Um, you know, clearly the um, operating environment related to regulations, it's, it's highly regulated, at least in our field in healthcare, uh, uh, both from the uh, uh, state level and then from a building perspective, obviously, of uh, OSHPOT, which everyone's aware of. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, 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 what that does is it drives cost up and it takes longer to it takes substantially longer to get things done. Sure. You indicated four months. I would say more like four years. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it takes a lot longer in California. So it's more regulated. It takes a much longer lead time. Um, it's more expensive to to conduct the business because of those things. And then the other complexity um, is uh, you know our union environment. At uh, Regional Medical Center, we have seven, we're represented by seven unions with nine uh, bargaining units. And, and that's another uh, factor that influences uh, our, our business. So uh, I, I would say it is different. I'm not saying it's worse. I'm just saying it's not bad or good. But it, it's clearly more it's difficult. Different. I think it takes longer to get things done. I think it drives cost up. So I have a next step. Uh Next question for you, Chris. It has been reported that your hospital is looking to merge with Oakland Children's Hospital. Um, what's the status of that? Is there any truth to it? And what's the benefit to Packard? Um, well, is there any uh, FTC attorneys in here? No. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, it's interesting because earlier we talked about the impact of health reform and the impact of the economy and so forth. and. I think what we're seeing in the industry, and then I'll talk specifically about Oakland, uh, is you know, I think all of us as providers are trying to figure out ways of, of surviving over the next several years and, and, and more than surviving, but, but really uh, being able to continue our missions. And um, one of the things we've uh, recognized at, uh, uh, at our hospital is, I mean, at, at the end of the day, children's, you know, the, the good news is that the vast, vast majority of children are healthy and never come near our place, which is a good thing. Um, but, um, and as a result of that, we have to pull patients from a very large area. We actually serve patients from over 40 states. Um, uh, uh, a little under 50% of our patients come from outside of the area. Um, we serve Santa Clara and San Mateo counties, and that's our primary service areas. But, uh, you know, uh, as I said, uh, uh, a little under 50% of the patients come from outside of that area. And uh, so we started discussions uh, a little over a year ago with Oakland Children's, with the leadership of Oakland Children's Hospital, to look at ways that we can, um, working together, better serve the community, provide better access, because access to pediatric subspecialty care is a significant issue in this country and certainly in this area. Um, and uh, those discussions um, are ongoing. Let me specifically talk about, when I say access, what I mean by that. One of the challenges we have in pediatric health care, which is unique to pediatrics as opposed to adult health care, uh, is that we hear on the adult side that there's not enough primary care, which is I'm sure is the case, and in many cases actually a surplus of um, specialists. Um, and there's a lot of movement within the government and within the Health Reform Act to try and shift dollars from specialty care into primary care. And I think that's the right thing to do on the adult side. In pediatrics, we actually have the opposite problem. Um, there is, for the most part, there's certainly pockets around the country that don't meet this, but the, for the most part, primary care is not the issue in, in pediatric care as in much as it is in the adult side. What it, the issue is pediatric specialty care. There is a dramatic shortage of pediatric specialty care. So you might want to ask, why is that the case? Well, just think about this. If you're a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, if you're an orthopedic surgeon, or you're going through training, you want to become an orthopedic surgeon, you finish your, your medical school, your residency, your fellowship, and at the end of that, you then decide to become a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. Now you have to go through three more years on top of what you've already done before you can earn any money of fellowship. And after the three years of doing that, you have the privilege of becoming a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and your income will be 50% of what it was had you been an adult pediatric orthopedic surgeon. So it's pretty obvious why we have a shortage of pediatric orthopedic surgeons. Uh, last year, this country generated less than 20 new pediatric orthopedic surgeons. So that's a significant issue, and there is a shortage in that regard. So as we um, uh, look you know, as, as we look, look ahead, we've got to figure out ways of doing that. So our relationship, our purpose in, in partnering with uh, uh, Oakland 
And I think by this fall that we'll have some answers to whether or not um, that's really going to happen, is how do we take that unique group of pediatric specialists, in our case about 250, in Oakland about 200, how do we bring those together so we can actually improve access to pediatric subspecialty care throughout the uh, Northern California? And that's really what's driving that. It is not a merger, um, but it is an alliance of some form which we're trying to <coughs> work our way through. I want to uh, ask about the American Medical Association uh, has suggested, among others, uh, that capping medical malpractice costs would lower the cost of health care. And in fact, right now, there's a, a federal uh, a bill that's pending that would limit the damages in malpractice cases to $250,000 and restrict fees to lawyers. This is a two-part question. What are the chances of a bill like this ever passing, and what would the impact be on your facility? And Terry, we'll start with you. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it, it actually have, already has passed in California. Um, it's the micro legislation that was passed back in 1975. Uh, with overwhelming bipartisan support, and essentially it capped uh, malpractice um, awards at $250,000 per case. So prior to that, some of us may remember that it, it, there, there were, uh, the papers were full of, uh, of, of tremendously um, generous awards from juries and others uh, to injure parties in malpractice cases. And uh, one effect of that was that it was driving a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of people out of, uh, out of providing, um, uh, pr providing medical care, particularly in the obstetrics and gynecology area, where, <clears throat> as I'm remembering, back in those days I ran a practice management company and I had some of these folks as, as, my, uh, as my clients. I, I can remember uh, OBGYNs and neurosurgeons going out of business and, and closing down their practice or selling their practice because they couldn't afford the malpractice insurance. So I think what, we've, what, what was recognized back then and what has worked very well for California to date is having a cap on the, um, on the um, uh, malpractice awards. And, and whether that, I'm not, I'm actually not privy to whether that is something that would uh, would be passed nationally. But I, I think that if people looked at the track record uh, over the last uh, 25, 30 years in California, uh, I, I think it's been proven as good legislation. Amir, Mike, Chris, anything you'd like to add to that? Well said. I want to talk about uh, staffing and labor for a minute. You've talked about it this morning, Mike. Um, there's lots of, um, you know, there's a nurses union and, and, and so on. What union agreements are up for renewal this year at your facilities? And can you give us a, a status update on those negotiations? And Amir and Chris are laughing. So Amir, actually, we're going to start with you. <laughs> sure. Well, Chris and I are both part of uh, Stanford Medicine and, and both uh, hospitals are affiliated with Stanford and we share certain services and we share a labor contract, so that's why we're smiling. Um, so we're in the middle of, um, of a negotiation process with our nursing union and we're actually uh, heading into mediation next Thursday, I believe, is our yeah. next session. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're very uh, hopeful and confident and optimistic. We have great nurses. We're what's called a magnet uh, nursing hospital. It's a certification, highest level certification of nursing. Um, in the United States, uh, we have outstanding nurses. Um, about 70 to 80 percent of our nurses in our hospitals uh, have at least a bachelor's degree. We have very high standards. Uh, many are masters and doctorate prepared, being a, a leading edge academic medical center. And we think differentiation on our part is is by having top talent, not only in the medical staff and physician staff. Um, so we have great nurses. I think we have a, a, a union that wants to do what's right for its staff as well. And um, sometimes our processes for getting there aren't uh, as ideal as we might like, but uh, I'm hopeful and, and optimistic that uh, we'll, we'll come to terms there. And Chris, do you want to add to that at all? No, I think it's well said. Mike? Well, as I indicated earlier, our hospital is governed under, um, you know, seven union contracts and then to nine uh, uh, bargaining units. We have, uh, and, and so over the last several years, uh, uh, you know, those are titrated, so we have one or two per year that we're kind of dealing with. Uh, over the last 24 months, we've just uh, successfully completed our negotiations with SEIU, uh, and so that is now complete for our hospital. 
in 2012, uh, we will be uh, working on our contract with the uh, California Nurses Association. Nancy Clark uh, is part of my staff. She's actually here today, Vice President for Human Resources, and does a lot of work in that regards. And once again, that those contracts are both for Regional Medical Center and Good Samaritan Hospital, and they also have implications for the HCA hospitals in Southern California. But as kind of Amir indicated, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, these uh, people all work at our hospital. They're important to the provision of care. We also have outstanding nurses and support uh, personnel. We want to treat these people right. We want to pay them fairly. We want them to have good benefits. Um, and uh, we have high expectations on how they uh, care for our patients. But uh, uh, it, it's just uh, part of, uh, you know, doing business. So we have two uh, big contracts currently underway. And Terry? And I'm pleased to say that ours are, are, are uh, <laughs> complete. Uh, we, um, we have two major contracts. Uh, one is with the California Nurses Association, and uh, that has just recently been completed and runs through 2014. So we're very pleased that we'll be able to uh, continue to count on uh, a, a very favorable relationship with our nurses and our nursing union for the next couple of years. We also have what is called a labor management partnership. And part of the labor management partnership is a group of unions that have agreed to, uh, to um, negotiate their agreements as a coalition. And so uh, we have um, typically, since back 1990, I believe it was, when we first started working with them, uh, uh, began working with the, uh, the coalition on, a, on developing the elements of the partnership, which is somewhat, diff uh, uh, somewhat different than a typical labor management relationship in that uh, the unions have opted to become more involved in contributing to the success of our company and uh, the success of the care that we provide to our members. So, for example, we have unit-based teams uh, that are well supported by the union and a great deal of training and infrastructure that they've provided, and it works out very well. Um, that, uh, that whole situation was stabilized last year uh, when our, um, the, the SEIU uh, was the prevailing union in California for the service workers, and so uh, that is now a stable situation, and that contract will run through the end of next year. I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about Sacramento. You've got a new administration there. Uh, I'd like to hear from each of you, and Terry, we'll start with you on <clears throat> what your thoughts are with a new administration in Sacramento and how it will impact the healthcare industry and, and hospitals. I'll start with you. Well, I think, first of all, um, I'm hopeful that the new administration, and I believe that they do, understand what an important employer hospitals are, as well as a provider of a critical service to communities. Uh, so, uh, and that means that as, as my colleagues have said um, uh, earlier, we have to produce a margin. We have to be able to in, reinvest in our, in our organizations. We have to be able to be supported by local as well as state um, uh, provisions that uh, allow us to operate our businesses without tremendous delays in uh, moving needed capital projects forward, for example. So those are the things that I would be looking for our, um, our new administration to focus on, as well as providing the, uh, the, the substrate, if you will, for uh, a successful rollout of healthcare reform. So we know that in California, the Medicaid program is run by Medi-Cal, and approximately half of the new eligibles will be Medi-Cal eligibles. And so we're looking for the state to be innovative, to be collaborative uh, with health plans and hospitals throughout California in ensuring that that new group of eligibles have access to care and that we can all do it successfully. And Chris. Well, I think kind of two thoughts about that. First is that I think as a citizen of California, I think overall the Brown administration is, I think is attempting to, to take to really tackle the hard issues. I mean, we've kind of kicked the budget can down the road far enough, and I think we are at the end of the road, and I think that they're really trying to tackle those issues in a very creative way. Um, I think on the health care side, there's obviously a lot of concerns we have. I mean, again, because we are primarily a Medicaid hospital, our future revenue streams, at least on the Medicaid side, um, are tied to the state. Mm -hmm. um, unlike Medicare, which as Medicare facilities, and, and which in most adult facilities have substantial Medicare programs, they're tied to the feds. 
Well, at the end of the day, and while there's a lot of targeting on Medicare, I mean, the federal government can at least print money. Um, uh, uh, maybe not so much in the future. But at the state level, they can. Uh, the states are kind of in a unique situation. They can't print money and they can't declare bankruptcy. And by any definition, obviously, the state of California is bankrupt, depending on, you know, I mean, by any definition. And, uh, and so and we're very concerned about um, uh, the, some of the proposals the Brown administration has put uh, in place. For example, uh, increasing co-pays. Um, well, if you have a, um, a, a person who's unemployed, is on Medicaid, and then you say, well, to, to visit the emergency department, you have to pay $50. Well, obviously, they're not going to give you $50. So what that means is it's a tax on the hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so I think there are some provisions within the, the current proposed budget by the Brown administration that will have a negative impact um, on, uh, on our facility. Mm -hmm. They're also proposing a 10% reduction uh, in terms of uh, the fee schedule for uh, physicians, and they'd like to look at a reduction for the hospitals as well. And so that $150 million gap that I talked about is just going to get bigger. Um, and and uh, so I think there's – I wouldn't kind of blame the administration. I think they're trying to tackle it as best they can, but I think the uh, – you know, I think we're entering the white water as, as it relates mm -hmm. to the, the state budget. And then there's the local municipal, municipalities and particularly the, 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 the counties, which are also a source of um, part of this infrastructure, and obviously they're hurting as well. So I think we've got some very, very tough times ahead of us, and I think those of us who are dependent on partially, at least partially dependent on Medicaid, um, are, are going to be uh, going to have some a very difficult time. Mike. I think about that from two perspectives, both for, uh, uh, first of all, I want to address the, the macro perspective, then make a couple of comments at the micro perspective. At the macro perspective, as we started the conversation, this is really about the economy. So uh, it's uh, difficult issues that I think uh, our new governor and the legislature are having to deal with, but clearly California is having some significant uh, financial difficulties. So, um, you know, like all of you, I wish them well. I hope that we're able to work through this very complex issues, trying to uh, come up with appropriate balance between tax and spend. But at the end of the day, if the California economy strengthens, uh, that benefits all of you and your businesses, but it also benefits uh, the hospitals and allows us to invest and to do what we're here to do, which is to take care of patients. So my, my biggest concern really is um, uh, I just want a strong economy in California because I think everyone benefits. Now, as uh, Chris indicated, not having a small, a strong economy, uh, both at the state level or at the federal level and national level, uh, clearly adversely impacts all of us, particularly the safety net hospitals, uh, the children's hospitals, um, get a disproportionate share of that. And there's more uh, patients on the Medi-Cal rolls. There's money, more uninsured patients. And so everyone um, is hurt. As Chris indicated earlier, the effective uh, impact of that is that cost is uh, shifted to other payers um, and or there's a tax on the hospital. So in my mind, the most important thing that we can do is grow the economy, stabilize the economy, come up with the... Um, hit the sweet spot between tax and spend to, to uh, uh, benefit everyone. Uh, there, there are a couple state issues in addition to the Medi-Cal reimbursement. Um, the state will also play an important role as back to health care reform. As health care reform begins to roll out, the split state will play an important role uh, with uh, health insurance exchanges and, and, and so this, the state from a regulatory perspective will impact our operations uh, relative to health care reform. Uh, but once again, in my mind, the most important thing we can do is strengthen the economy. Amir. Yeah, I think all those comments are very insightful, and I would concur with all of them. Just to maybe echo one theme of Mike's, I'd like Silicon Valley to quadruple over the next 20 years. <laughs> that would help. And, and are we thinking about things like that? I mean, if you look at our nation's economy and what uh, the folks in this room have done towards it, look at all the bright engines in our, in our nation and the world's economy and how much have come from this region. So I think that's going to really help. And so how do we do that? How do we make sure that the region that we're all part of continues to be an engine for innovation and growth and a great place to live and to work and to start a new company and to get health care and education and the other services that people in our region need? So um, I, I think that's, that should be our long-term vision and strategy. Uh, now there's a lot of work in between there. Right, right. But uh, I, I think if we keep focusing on that, 
then we'll be positioned well. If, if we are not competitive, it's not a good place to start a company. It's not a good place to grow. You shouldn't put your next building up here. You should move it somewhere else. I think then we're, then we're in trouble. All of you have talked about prevention. So what, what needs to happen to get people off the couch and into the gym or on a bicycle? Because that has a direct impact on the costs of health, health insurance and employee benefits. And Terry, I'm going to start with you there. You know, <clears throat> this is the area where Kaiser should be the best of the world because we're so integrated. Uh, and yet, I will tell you that I don't think we do as good a job <clears throat> as we need to in this area. Um, uh, I, I think that I, I think that that we have to find a way to motivate people personally, and <clears throat> we have to find a way to motivate people in in the context of what they care about. And uh, they care about um, they care care about discounts. They care about uh, financial benefits. Um, we, uh, um, it, it is no secret that smoking is deadly, and yet we still have people who smoke. It's no secret that obesity leads to a tremendous variety of chronic conditions, and yet we still have people, and we still have Kaiser members, who are morbidly obese. So, so there's something about the circumstance of each of those individuals that is keeping them from making the choices that they need to make in order to get beyond whatever problem is holding them back from and achieving health. what do you health. think that is? I, you know, I think it's different for every person. I wish I, wish I knew what that is, but, but I, I think it's different for every person. And I think, I think it comes to different people at different times in their lives as well. Maybe depending upon circumstances where uh, someone has a chronic condition and now all of a sudden you wake up to the risk that you may also be at risk for a chronic condition. Um, I, I think that that's something as healthcare organizations we're going to have to become better at because I don't, I don't think we relate to our, our, our patients or our members in that way, in a way that, that, that leads to a, 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 um, a, a conversion, if you will, of, of, those, of those people who, are, uh, who are, uh, have um, adopted unhealthy lifestyles and moving them to the healthy lifestyle end of things. Mike, I see you. I have a couple of thoughts about that. It, you know, it, it's a co-responsibility. I mean, we all have a responsibility. Government has a responsibility. Uh, families have a responsibility. Healthcare have, uh, uh, providers have a responsibility. Business has a responsibility. And part of this is education. But it kind of reminds me of raising your your children. I think of our, our kids. You know, we can provide them the information. We can provide them the education. We can role model what their behavior is, and we can try to influence them. But at the end of the day, they have to make that decision. It's an internal decision. It's the paradox of, you know, once again, back to the sweet spot. How do we construct a model where part of it is the carrot, the incent we want to incentivize you to live a healthy lifestyle, not to use tobacco products, not to drink and drive, not to be obese, to exercise on a routine basis, to take your medication when you're discharged from the hospital with, um, uh, with uh, congestive heart failure. You know, how do we put those incentives out there to you from a financial perspective and also from a health perspective? And yet, there has to be uh, some appropriate uh, sticks, kind of like with uh, raising kids. And so I, I think that's the, you know, that's the trick. And that's from a public policy perspective, from a health care perspective, and from a government at all levels of government, federal, state, and local, you know, how, how, do, how do we do that? Prevention is absolutely critical, and yet those decisions, Terry, you're right. You know, we always talk about education. People know they don't, they shouldn't smoke, but they want to smoke. People know they shouldn't be overweight. They like to eat. They don't want to exercise. So we always get on this education thing. Do I support education? Absolutely. But we all know that the education in large parts out there, it's the people's individual behaviors. That's why I'm an advocate of a really drilling down into what's the appropriate carrots and sticks to modify behavior. Amir, yes. I, I, I agree with Terry and Mike, and I think it's um, – Prevention approaches, if you will, will need to take multi-prong approaches. So as I was saying, things like even obesity and diabetes, I'm not sure they're going to be solved by health delivery systems. 
Those are going to be solved by um, health districts or regions or communities because the time frame is long. Like developing good habits in the home, good habits in school, good eating habits, uh, those things will pay back, but not over the time frame that you make a margin in the health plan business. Right. You know, that, may, that may be 20 years. They may not live in your community anymore. So some aspects are at that level. On the other extreme, um, we do have patients who are, as I was talking before, who are uh, carrying with them multi-chronic conditions and who are going to be, uh, potentially going to be, in an acute situation. And I think those are situations that we can intervene more prospectively. Uh, we're developing a model we call it the ambulatory ICU model. And really what this is, is in a very, just like an intensive care unit on an inpatient basis, on an outpatient basis, we're taking patients who are at risk uh, and have multiple risk factors and ma intensively managing them prospectively uh, with multiple specialists with extended visits, not with shortened primary care visits, with longer visits. And uh, people have talked about these models, but I don't think these models are going to work for the entire United States because they're, they're going to be expensive. But they may work on a smaller, expensive, intensive population. So I think we're going to need the gamut from uh, community interventions, um, uh, prevention, wellness, education, to new ways to intervene on the acute side, and all along that there needs to be the demand side, uh, the demand side, the, the behavioral economics, if you will. Uh, it can't just be done on a supply side approach. There's no amount of regulations sure. or new reimbursement systems um, when you're dealing with things like the family structure and home and education and community and peer influences. Mm -hmm. Those those need broader um, uh, levers. Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, I as I, we'll I, come back to you just to I, as I indicated yeah. earlier, um, I agree with Amir. These are long-term strategies. I do think that, particularly in organizations like ours uh, in the academic environment, have an opportunity to, to or have an obligation really to offer the community um, ways of addressing some of these issues. We're very fortunate. Right in this community, we have a, a researcher by the name of Tom Robinson, who's a pediatrician and is a national, in fact, international leader in pediatric obesity prevention. Um, he, just, uh, he just actually got a, a $12 million grant from NIH, which in this day and age is almost unheard of, um, to pursue various research activities. What's interesting about Tom is that he uh, has focused on, uh, on intervention in schools, intervention at the home, and really looking at ways of trying to address behavioral changes and has had significant success. So as I mentioned earlier, I think what we're actually looking at is working with Tom to put together a wellness program for kids that we would then offer as a service to um, corporations in this valley so that it can be built into your programs for your employees. Um, if you take what you spend on health care and you just take a small fraction of that and invest it in some of these preventive programs, uh, while that won't give you an ROI in the next two years, it may give you an ROI within five years or within ten years. Um, and, uh, and most importantly, it will have a very big impact on this valley over time. So I think those are the kinds of things that we can provide. Um, we're, as a healthcare provider, you know, obviously um, we're, our focus is inpatient and outpatient care, but I think we do have an obligation, James, to provide services like this into the community. Mike, I know you wanted to just add to that. Yeah, one thing that Amir said that it got me thinking back because I think it's really important, and you've actually heard it several times in different ways here, uh, but even though we are trying to drive consistency and reduce variation, and, and we are from the, from the perspective of trying to deliver health care, when it comes to systems and structures that um, uh, health care is provided locally, so this notion of one size fits all, I agree with Mir, that really doesn't work. Um, you know, healthcare is local, it's regional. From a public policy perspective, we're going to have to be thinking about that way because I can tell you the way that healthcare is delivered in, in South Texas or in Omaha, Nebraska is dramatically different than in Northern California. There's pros and cons on different models, but there's different peoples, different thought processes, different dynamics. And so this was trying to emphasize that um, healthcare really is regional. All of us need to be working together to develop systems for Northern California. You know, one other. Oh, yes, yes. yes. One, one other comment this. on this, because as other people mentioned, we are employers as well. Yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> we're doing some of this. Um, so actually, along with some of the leaders at our university who are leading this effort, we are looking at our own 
wellness programs, and we are instituting health risk assessments. Uh, we are uh, delivering uh, differential financial incentives uh, based on completing health risk assessments. We are offering courses and classes on smoking cessation and exercise. And um, so I think one thing that we do need to do is we need to lead by example as, as employers. And uh, we maybe haven't been that great at that as well, but that's something that, that we're all, I know all of us are, are focused on that as well. And I, I really do think um, it, it will make an impact. Um, again, it, it may take a period of time, but uh, it's part of our obligation. So Terry, Chris, and then I have to ask one more question. <laughs> so Terry, would okay. you? Um, I, 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 there's good news. Good, good news on the horizon. Um, we're, uh, you renewed we, your subscription to the business. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. For me and my best friend. Um, uh, the uh, work, worksite wellness programs, which uh, Kaiser has now had in place for a, a while, uh, have uh, really begun to be an area of interest for our subscribers. And so um, as, we, as we go out and renew contracts or, or initiate new ones, there's a lot of interest in worksite wellness and the advent of our Health Connect inf clinical information system has allowed us to be more effective in being able to demonstrate clinically mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the e effect of those, of those kinds of programs. So I think that we're getting closer to that and then what will follow is the behavior modification or whatever techniques we choose in order to uh, have the, the, the patient population or the member population uh, comply with the plan. Okay. Last word on this, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to add that I think the important point here is that this is just one of several strategies that we're talking about to try and right. wrestle that, the cost of health care. Wellness programs prevention are long-term strategies, but they're critical to the, to the, I think, in the future. But so is, you know, intensive ambulatory care programs. So is care for chronically ill, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all different uh, approaches. All of We have to kind of go down all these paths, mm -hmm. I think, to try and wrestle um, uh, the, uh, to reverse the current situation. We have time for just a couple more questions, and we have a lot of people in construction, architecture here today. Very quickly, update on hospital construction projects at your facility, Amir. We're uh, hopeful to get approval from the city of Palo Alto for our entitlements in the next couple of months and start swinging shovels and uh, we've got make ready projects before we actually uh, work on the new tower so I, I hope to be tearing up the road this summer. Mike. Well as I indicated in my earlier remarks, a very exciting time at Regional Medical Center. Uh, recently completed projects, the uh, major expansion to the intensive care unit, we've redone some of our ORs. Uh, we've uh, uh, constructed a two-story uh, building. One story is built out. They're working on the second story right now. Uh, we have a groundbreaking yesterday, uh, yesterday uh, for our four-story tower, 161,000 square feet. Um, Skanska, they're here today with a, a table. Uh, there are contractors. Many of you in this room are the subs, and we very much appreciate your support. That's a major expansion project, once again, about $300 million in, in private capital. I mean, this is not government funded. So uh, we, we're excited about that because we think that provides jobs to the community, uh, and construction jobs and trade jobs, uh, and then obviously also uh, builds the infrastructure for, for health care uh, in East San Jose for an extended period of time. In addition to that, we have um, uh, uh, kind of a campus refresh. We're putting sprinkler systems in parts of our buildings. We have an $18 million expansion of our emergency department that's coming out of Oshpah that starts in, in uh, July. So at Regional Medical Center, there are actually three major construction projects. I mean, uh, I mean, there's cranes and bulldozers and contractors everywhere. So it's a very uh, exciting time. Once again, we think this is great for our community. Chris. Uh, well, we're on the same schedule uh, with uh, as Amir. So Amir and I will both be out there with the shovels uh, hopefully this summer. Uh, but I think, you know, when you look at the economic impact of this, I mean, Stanford's project is close to $2 billion. Um, our project is, clo is close to a billion dollars. So that's $3 billion of hospital construction projects. On, on one campus um, that's going to be uh, uh, very active for the next decade, so and hopefully less. 
and Terry. And in San Jose, we are uh, focusing on uh, some campus refresh as well, uh, redoing bathrooms and, and lobbies and, and uh, uh, just received funding for a new uh, lab and pathology suite and nuclear medicine suite. So we're very excited about some of the upgrades that we're doing. Well, I think everybody in the room knows that our Santa Clara facility uh, replaced itself in 2007, and we're very excited. We're we're um, we're technically good until 2030, but we're hoping that we can uh, uh, wrest the money away from our program office and rebuild our facility earlier than that. Right. You're. Uh actually retiring at the end of June, is that right? I am. And do you have any announcements that you'd like to share with us as to where you're going? Or where you're <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, you know, actually, um, well, first of all, I, I'm kind of amazed that I ever got to this point because I, you know, if you'd asked me two years ago, I I, I would have told you I, I, I'm never thinking about going, getting around to retiring. So the fact that I can even think about it and be coherent in that is, <laughs> is, is, is kind of exciting. And my wife is very excited. Um, <clears throat> You know, I've had a wonderful career, and it's just time. Um, I, I started out my career as a laundry manager at the old San Jose Medical Center in downtown San Jose. I've, I've seen some people sort of reflect on that a little bit. It was a great time, uh, and today is a great time to be in hospital management. And um, I've, had a, I've had a wonderful career, and I'm very excited about uh, the next phase. So if we're on this uh, stage in 12 months, all together again, what will be the healthcare story that is going to be the big healthcare story over the next 12 months? Is there a trend story that we should all follow here? Amir, I start with you. Well, you'll be hearing from Stanford how we've come out with a new cure for cancer in a targeted area. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, today we can do brain surgery literally through your eye, through your nose, through your ear. I just visited yesterday a 92-year-old minimally invasive valve patient who's going home, a physician, going home in one day. Um, I think you're going to hear incredible breakthroughs. And I was just meeting with, literally with our cancer center people this week. I think we have a whole new world of targeted uh, therapies coming out. And, and not just identifying genetically uh, what we're predisposed to, but uh, a lot of the targeted therapies like rituxin for lymphoma developed at Stanford, they only work, they're 30% effective. They're not 30% effective. They're 100% effective for the 30% of the people that respond to them. And so what we're starting to do is understand um, that it's, uh, that we're all different. We have genetic makeups uh, sure. that are different. And how do we have uh, treatment approaches that respond to that? So I think you'll continue to hear out of Stanford new minimally invasive approaches, less invasive approaches, increased interaction through information technology, and uh, new cutting edge breakthroughs. Mike. I think if we're sitting on the stage a year from now, we're going to continue to be talking about the financing of health care. You know, how is a, um, a community, how is a government, a state government, or a national government, we, we, we finance this and we structure health care for the maximum benefit for patients. Regarding Regional Medical Center, what we'll be knowing is uh, we'll be monitoring the construction project. Once again, we're very proud of the provision of services there. We have excellent nursing staff. You'll be we'll be talking about our trauma program, our stroke program, our cardiac program, our minimally invasive mitral natural uh, valve program for cardiac services. Uh, and just an expansion of uh, services. Stanford's a, a wonderful place, but an international academic setting, more focused on uh, research and the provision of care. Regional Medical Center, uh, they take care of uh, the people in um, the eastern corridor of San Jose. We're proud to be a part of your community. Chris. Uh, well, we'll uh, a year from now, we'll be um, in a presidential election year. That will certainly uh, be an interesting experience, given the current politics in Washington. So I have a feeling that will be part of the questions that you will ask uh, uh, a year from now. Uh, I agree with, uh, with uh, Mike, uh, and as much as I think we'll still be talking about uh, the delivery of health care. Um, and uh, I also think that we'll, uh, you know, if we're really lucky, um, you know, if Apple can come out with a new iPad in less than a year, hopefully we can come out with some more innovative ways, uh, as Amir suggested, in terms of the of, of uh, addressing some of the challenges we have. So I'm hoping that a year from now we will talk about some innovative, um, uh, not only innovations in terms of uh, addressing cancers and, and surgical techniques and so forth, but also uh, some innovations in terms of the delivery of care um, and moving more of that delivery of care um, into the home, 
um, and into the outpatient environment and so forth. I think we'll see a lot more of that occurring, and I, I would suspect that that might be one of the topics that uh, you'll talk about a year from now. Yeah, I would agree with the, th those comments. Um, I, I think we're going to see more in the area of telemedicine. I think we're going to see more in the area of, <clears throat> excuse me, virtual office visits. Um, uh, we've just opened a breast cancer care center in San Jose uh, that focuses on the individual and their disease rather than on a succession of uh, specialist visits. So uh, when, a, when a, uh, a member has a, a possibility of having uh, breast cancer, the, ne the, next, um, the next visit is with the oncologist and the surgeon and the plastic surgeon and anyone else that that individual is going to eventually need should the diagnosis uh, be the one that is going to require treatment. Uh, we're very excited about that. We think that has tremendous potential in uh, helping us um, meet the healthcare needs of the Medi-Cal population when they become more of who we see. And uh, we think that there's a, a lot of potential in just making the delivery of care more efficient. Great. Thank you, Terry. A round of applause for our panel this morning.